I have the honor of introducing Sparky, otherwise known as Mark Spences. And I first got to know Sparky, or was aware of him, I guess, in 1994. I had to look it up. When he was a stunt, I don't think you could call him a man because that was 30 years ago and he was a young whippersnapper at that point. <laughs> but he was a stunt double for the guy who started, starred in Iron Will. Do you remember when they filmed Iron Will here? He's a snow person, so he, he helped out with that movie. I, I looked it up today and found Kevin Spacey was in that too. Yeah. I got to know him. <laughs> Um, Sparky is also um, the author of a number of books. He's a publisher of many books. If you ever go out to the bar, you'll see in the um, visitor center a whole display of a lot of those books, natural history books of all kinds, probably others as well. He tells me he has a YouTube channel, which I have not yet looked at, I'm sorry to say. But I see plenty of his photographs. He is also a wonderful photographer and videographer on Facebook and on Friends of Sex and Bob website. None of that, however, is why he is here today. He can't talk about any of that, yes, he will, but he is executive director of Friends of Sex and Bob. And that was the result of an election. So I invite you to clear from your head all thoughts of the upcoming election, which have worried you, and celebrate the fact, I know, celebrate the fact that you have already voted for the Friends of Sex and Bob, and they are the Wolf and Basket recipient for the month. And I'll turn it over to Sparky. Thank you, Barb. And yeah, and... Uh, I, I, I think actually I knew Barb's in the 80s because uh, Kim, her partner's bird class. I'm sure we had bird class together. Bird college, what do you call it? I can't remember, but long time ago. And I and Kim was also one of the founders of the Friends of Sac Zimbog, along with me and Dave Benson. So, but uh, long history in Duluth, came here for college and uh, couldn't leave, couldn't leave. <laughs> But thank you, and today, yeah, first of all, of course, thank you for choosing us for the, the Woven Basket in November. That is awesome. We we really, really appreciate that. That's special. But what's special about Saxonburg? How many of you have been there? Oh, okay, we got to get some of you up there. Um, you know where it is, right? Out by Meadowlands and Cotton. It's one of the most accessible spots in the Boreal Forest. Um, and what we call the boreal forest is that ring around the planet, right? From Scandinavia to Suomi. What's Suomi? Finlanders. Yeah, Finland, yeah. It basically means swamp. That's right. To Saskatchewan, to Siberia, to the Saxon Bog, all around the planet. And, and I'm going the wrong way. There we go. So 300 square miles of habitat is what we call the Sac Zimbog. And there's 3 million acres of peatland in Minnesota. So that's where we are, where that little star popped up, right in the heart of well, the second biggest peatland in Minnesota. And one of the most popular birding locations in the country. I mean, if you're doing a big year, right, you got to come to the Sac Zimbog. If you're doing a... Uh, you know, want to get those boreal species that can't get anywhere else easily. You know, most people aren't going to fly by bush plane up into the middle of Alaska or Canada to get a lot of the species you can see right up here. Um, it's accessible. And it's, in winter, we're known for northern owls, you know, the great gray, the boreal owl, and winter finches. But in summer, we have a special group of warblers too. Everybody loves warblers. We have a Connecticut warbler. Terrible name, but a beautiful warbler. Um, it's a warbler of the Northwoods. It's found in Connecticut first, but Lacan Sparrow and, and 19 other species of warblers as well. And year-round birds like the great gray owl. That's a year-round resident. Now, you can have many different types of experiences in Sac Zim, and we're talking why it's special. One is the abundance of owls. Um, 
Sometimes it's the abundance of photographers and birders, uh, too. Um, there's probably about a half million dollars worth of equipment in that photo. Um, but and get, and get, and brace yourself. We might be in for a big eruption this winter. Uh, the signs are already there. There's great grays showing up out of range. Hawk owls showing up out of range in October. And there were 13 boreal owls that just banded the other night at the Hawk Ridge. Uh, so it could be a, a big eruption. Or you can have a solitary, wonderful experience all alone on a back road. So there's a lot of wild attractions, of course. Little boreal chickadee, that's not your backyard chickadee. It will never touch the sunflower seed, ever. <laughs> that bird likes fat, meat, suet, dead things, fat, and peanut butter. Um, They'll land, and I used to have one. I, I'd get out of the car, and knew it was Sparky, and I knew the Sparky's peanut butter jar. They would come and land on the lid, and I'd have to say, Buddy, I gotta get the lid off because it's <laughs> not. Blackback woodpecker, also never gonna leave the bog, rarely ever leaves the bog. They like their sharp tailed grouse. Yes. I she is, is sharing on Zoom. She was asking. It doesn't look like Zoom is in the pictures. Oh, Zoom's on here. Go. That's not here. Oh, that's just, yeah. If, if you want to, Mark, are you okay to actually stand right here? That way for us, right, people. That's all right. Hi. Hi. <laughs> um, yeah, magpies, the furthest east population in the United States occurs in the Sac Zim Bog, um, in North America, in fact. That's a corvid. They eat a lot of dead things, too. A lot of things in the bog eat a lot of dead things. Rough-legged hawks eat dead things, but uh, they're also part of the vole snatchers. we got a lot of birds that eat voles, including one songbird, the northern shrike. A lot of people like to see them. They nest up in Canada. Same with the the rough-legged hawk, they nest on the tundra, so it's special to have them here in the winter. American goshawk, not the northern goshawk anymore. Now it's the American goshawk. They split it off from the European one. Eats a lot of snowshoe hares up in the bog. The females eat snowshoe hares. The males are smaller, much smaller. They eat rough grouse. Canada jays, um, really cool birds. They uh, basically nest in the winter and uh, build these big bulky nests in the fall. Right now, they're stashing food all over in the woods under bark and tufts of pine needles. They take uh, food and chew it up. They have some of the biggest saliva glands of any bird in the world, and make these sticky pellets and stash them all over in the woods. And they're a jay, so they can remember where they put them. And that's how they're able to nest in March when they, you know, it might be three feet of snow on the ground. So really interesting bird. People come for the pine grosbeaks. Once again, they're coming south from Canada. Hoary red pole, white winged crossbills, evening grosbeaks is a big one. Uh, they have kind of made a big comeback because of spruce budworm, because of COVID. They made a big comeback because of COVID. Um, uh, they're dependent on uh, for boom bust on spruce budworm caterpillars. And during COVID, Canada couldn't spray for <laughs> spruce budworm. And so the budworm kind of took off in the you know, no, nothing in nature is ever completely bad, okay? You know, you talk to a forester, they're gonna say, oh, Eastern larch beetle, terrible, terrible. Well, not terrible for the blackback woodpeckers and three-toed woodpeckers. You always gotta think holistically that, you know, you know, that's bad, but hey, it's good for somebody. Summer attractions, of course, the Connecticut warbler, uh, you know, small range in North America, Minnesota is kind of the core. Um, people come from all over to photograph them, including the warblers, golden-winged, blackburnian, morning warbler, and Leconte sparrow. Uh, you know they're changing all the names, right, to uh, all the honorific names, so no more Leconte sparrow or Wilson's warbler. That's all going to change, so I'm not sure what's going to call this one. Maybe the orange-faced sparrow. It's, it's one of our most beautiful sparrows. And orchids, we are known for orchids. And this is a composite by Ben Yokel, <laughs> just of all the, some of the orchids. 
um, we have. So there's many things, including mammals, ermine and pine marten, especially because they will come to our rib cages and our suet that we put out. And we get rib cages from hunters and put them in the woods, about 15 to 20 a year. And that brings in, um, we put them off the ground and uh, that brings in ermine and marten and of course a ton of birds who like to pick away at the fat. And wolves and bobcats, a lot of wolves, a lot of bobcats up there. And more and more moose, fortunately, they're doing pretty well in Minnesota these days. And, you know, nowhere near back to the levels of the 80s and 90s, but uh, coming back. And the owls, the little cute sawbud owl on the left and the northern hawk owl, they've already been seeing a few hawk owls. Snowy owls and boreal, this is what I'm talking about. They banded 13 of those, they're super rare. I should say super rarely seen, <laughs> are they ever seen? And the great gray, the most wanted species in all seasons. And people are really happy when they see one. He's silenced. He's silent yelling. He's not screaming. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I, I just wanted to show you a little video on great grays. I don't know. You probably don't. Yeah, there we go. Let's see. But what do they do if there's really deep snow? Great grays have a couple of cool adaptations. Number one, like all owls, they use their ears. They're using that big, massive facial disc to focus sound to their ears, uh, which are offset, helps them triangulate prey underneath the snow. So when we watch a great gray owl perch, most of the time we're seeing it look around. If you're using your ears to hunt, you have to spend a lot of time. This the diet of a great gray owl is bulls. They can hear a bull under two feet of snow from about a hundred yards. So when an owl is focused in on a bull under the snow with its ears, they pop off the perch, might hover a little bit, but the cool thing about owls is they have really wide wings. Those wide wings hold a lot of air so they can fly very slow. If you're hunting with your ears, you're gonna have to fly this. So when we think about a fish, that's, it's all about focusing sound. The sound's coming in, it's giving that owl a clue to where that prey is. might be in the snow. Their ears are offset, which means sound is going to be uh, hitting one ear before the other, knowing then where that prey is, even if they can't see it. And then plunges, shoots those legs down up to a foot and a half underneath the snow. It's feet first. Then head Great gray owls have incredibly long legs. Uh, they can uh, catch that prey item with those legs or reach down as far as about a foot and a half, 18 inches or so, underneath the snow to help them catch that bull. You'll get great gray owls sitting in the snow, almost like they're stuck. They look around, <laughs> look at the ravens, they're looking for crows or blue jays or any other bird that might want to take that bull. They're going to make sure the coast is clear. So after you cut that bowl of your great growl and then you swallow it down, it's in one go. That bowl goes in and then it goes down. Until next. So that was Clinton, our head naturalist. Uh, we worked together on some of these videos, and I did the videography because the 
narration, but some of the points takeaway, that's the number one draw on this exam, I'll tell you that. Um, that's where people are coming from all over the country to see. Uh, but 97% of their diet is that those little bowls, even though they're the 30, you know, 28 to 32 inches tall, you know, that's what fuels them. And bowls are super important in the bog. So many species depend on just bowls. And so uh, it also that they can hear one under two feet of snow from a hundred yards away. I mean, just imagine that. And when they fly out, they, they don't know exactly where it is when they jump up, pop, pop off that perch. But then when they get close, they are able to triangulate that facial disc, collect sounds just like a satellite dish, and focuses it. That's good. I wanted to ask how we can, I didn't mean to get yeah. your attention that way. <laughs> how, you, how you got those under the snow pictures? Barb, you had to ask that. <laughs> well, it's a dead great great. It's a dead one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what else am I going to get that shot? <laughs> Sad. It's a sad story, but uh, it, it, it's going to a good purpose to show how to punch. And, uh, he might be one mounted in the welcome center now. But, yeah. Oh, Barb. <laughs> one, of the, one of the problems with... Uh, Let's, we'll, do, uh, we'll pass the mic around. One of the problems with the Great Grease is that uh, they get hit on the road of I think what we'll actually do, this is, sorry about this, we'll just pass the marks around. There we go. It's, uh, there's a lot of fatality on the roads because they have such a narrow focus. Yeah. You'll be driving along, and even I knew they were out here, you know, um, just cars and roads, a lot of them, and I, you'll dive right down in front of your yeah. car because they see that. Oh, yeah. Uh, and so you have to be really careful when you get invaded with these yes. great graves. That's a good point. You kill them so easily. Yeah. That's a good point. They are very focused. They have no concept of cars or humans. You know, they're they're extremely. We don't say tame. We say tolerant and trusting, because right? they don't really know what we are. And uh, but yeah, when they get close, even if they're coming over a road, they're triangulating. That's all they care about. They're triangulating. They, that sound is coming and collecting in their facial discs and being focused on their ear holes, which are in the front of their face. One's a little different shape and the size and shape it. So they're, you know, the sound frequency is a little different and they're able to pinpoint. But what's even more amazing, they just found this out, is that you know, sound when it travels up through the snow, it the sound waves get bent, right? It's not coming straight up. So that owl has to calculate the angle of diffraction of the sound. So it's pretty amazing. Amazing critters. But you know, who are we? We're Friends of Sex in Bog. We're a 501c3, founded in 2011. Like I said, with Kim Eckert, Dave Benson, and myself, there's <laughs> Kim and Barb, uh, winners of one of our Birdathon events. We have a Birdathon, the world's coldest Birdathon. Um, that's 2015. Uh, but our mission to preserve and protect the greater Sex in Bog. That's, that is our mission. And through land preservation, we're, we're primarily a land preservation organization. Number one, absolutely number one. We, we, uh, secondarily, education and research, although- You want to go back to the screen for the benefit of the people online coming. I'm standing- Oh, sorry. <laughs> so, um, yeah, you know, for future generations of birds and birders, and by birds and birders, I mean all critters and all humans and for all future, <laughs> as long as we have bog. We'll get to that, but here's why we we when I I started birding here in 1981, um, and things changed over the next few decades. Black spruce became very very valuable, and uh, it was used at the mill in Duluth to make glossy paper um, because it has long fibers, and glossy paper is really good for newspaper inserts, those set Sunday newspaper, and so. You know, that's what this black spruce breed cutting down for. And these forests, black spruce takes 80 to 120 years to get back to maturity. So I thought, you know, Sag Zimbog needs a voice. It's just a blank spot on the map. You know, what do we, we got to do something. And so we got together at um, Bixby's and um, kind of made a plan. We're going to, we need a gateway experience for all these birders coming and we need to start buying up land. 
And Google Earth is a blessing and a dis and a, <laughs> a curse because look at that 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 bog disappeared from one year to the next. There's that pristine black spruce bug. And then I look at the next Google Earth and um, there it went, you know, and that's multiple generations, you know, and for what, right? You know, Sunday newspaper inserts. So anyway, we got started, um, built the Welcome Center. We've now added on with the Lois King Education Center. So that was in 2022. It's been a huge boon for us. Uh, we get six, seven, 8,000 people every winter. 85% of our visitors come in the winter. Uh, we also have the Louvre, the world's only outhouse gallery. Uh, so outhouse art gallery. So if, if there's one reason to come to this exit <laughs> book, uh, this is really it because we don't have running water. There's no running water anywhere in our sites. Um, so finding an outhouse, we have them scattered around the, the bog, but this, this is the one at the main welcome center. But we also invested money in getting people that experience, right? That I call it the cathedral experience under the canopy of a mature old growth black spruce bog. And so we started building boardwalks and um, we've had a lot of success um, raising money uh, for these. These are my kids actually outside. This is kind of a rare photo here. Um, but um, yeah, this is one Kim helped uh, raise the money for in memory of Bob Russell. Uh, we have other ones in memory of like Warren Nelson. So we have four boardwalks right now. We're building another one this uh, fall, although we're creeping up on winter. I hope <laughs> we'll see if we get it done. Um, so it enables people to get out there and experience it because Otherwise, you know, you're, you're worried about getting lost, getting your feet wet, breaking an ankle. You know, I mean, those are serious things when you, you know, if you wander off in the wrong direction, the Saxon bog, it could be days before you get to the next road. So it's a real thing. So the boardwalks have been kind of a big part of our growth and people being able to enjoy the bog, you know. And this is the newest one, which is right behind the Welcome Center. So now you can make a nice loop, about a half mile loop, or make it into a mile and a half. And we start putting up bird feeders around the bog. And that kind of ties into education. There's Clinton in front um, uh, and with a group for uh, his one of his adventure weekends. Clinton, uh, there in the green vest, he's been a big asset for us. And now we have this Lois King education space. So we have Friday nights or Friday afternoon speakers in the winter. And now we're open in the summer as well. So, um, and once again, there's my kids actually doing something educational. Unbelievable. And we have a very involved board. There's Lori Williams, our board chair with another group of visitors of kids. And uh, school groups, there's not a lot of schools up there. We're trying to expand that. Uh, we do a lot with adult education, uh, less so with kids because there's just a, not a lot of schools up there. But more and more, we're, we've got a yellow bus fund now. So if school groups want to make that trip and can't afford it, if they can get the time, we can pay for it. And a lot of field trips, Warbler Wednesdays, Clinton's field trips doing, and Clinton knows a lot about a lot. You know, you, you hear a lot about people who know a lot about a little or a little about a lot. He knows a lot about a lot. <laughs> and then events and outreach. If you if you want to get to something that, uh, you know, you can have your pick of field trips. If you don't know what you want to do, come to our Bog Bio Blitz. Um, it's in August next summer. And uh, you can go out if you want interest in dragonflies. You can go out and do dragonflies. If you want to do orchids, you can go do orchids. If you want to do birds, you can do birds. If you want to do fishes, you can do fishes. So, and then we, the best part is we all meet back at like two o'clock and then share our findings. And that, that's a blast. And we've recorded now, and Clinton's the keeper of this, but over 3,800 species recorded in the sex in bog. So people say, you know, we're trying to change that perception of a bog as a swamp, which is a worthless swamp. You know, we're trying to, you know, this is amazing habitat and it, it's around the globe and it's important for bog diversity. We call it bog diversity. Um, yeah, so 3,000, and all of these you can find, well, most of them on iNaturalist and you can see the photos of all these species. And we also do the birdathon, like I talked about, the world's coldest birdathon coming up here in January. 
Tiny Bird Art, this is one you may be interested in. If you're an artist, we ask artists to submit uh, six by six inch, that's the max size. Okay, five by seven, fine, or smaller. And it's and then we auction them off online. So we call it the Tiny Bird Art and, and it's a lot of fun. Uh, I think, yeah, deadline for if you're an artist or know an artist who, and it's only birds, uh, preferably birds that can be found in Northern Minnesota. Um, and then the auction is in January 23rd to the 26th this coming year. So fun event. We have our calendar every year. This has turned into a big thing. I brought some with, okay. <laughs> Brett's holding up some. Uh, this has turned into a big deal for us because um, all the photos taken in each one of these calendars were only taken the previous year and all in the bog. So, you know, somebody's got a cool photo they took five years ago. Uh -uh, not allowed. So every photo in there was taken within the last 12 months and in the bog. So it's kind of a cool thing. Um, and then we put the, you know, a lot of fun facts and dates in there and stuff. And then YouTube, uh, Barb mentioned Utah. Uh, I tell my kids, tell your friends I'm a YouTuber. And I actually have some uh, eighth grade fans now. So, uh, and so we have uh, Clinton's Critters. We got three episodes. Those are fun. You saw the great gray owl. That was one of them. Uh, Clinton also goes out and looks at other things besides birds. And those are called Clinton's Bog Ventures. There's nine of those. And then I've got 48 episodes of um, virtually live. And this started, this is another good thing that came out of COVID, okay? There's a few good things, is people couldn't come on our field trips. So we started bringing the field to them, right? And so I started going out in the field and doing these 15, 20 minute videos uh, and their field trips. And they also update people on what's happening at SAC Zim. So it's called Virtually Live. They're, they're on our website, saczim.org. Um, they're also on my YouTube, which is just Sparky Stensus. So we've got a lot of videos and you can join us. I'm, I'm just finishing up one that'll be dropped in a few weeks here, uh, episode 49. So stay tuned. So virtual outreach has become huge for us. You do a field trip, right? You get, you're affecting 10 people. You put it on Facebook, you're affecting maybe a hundred or 500 or a thousand. Put it on YouTube, you know, sky's the limit, thousand to 5,000 to 20,000. So it's kind of the way it is these days. So that's a big part of there. A lot of the videos are on our homepage on our website. You can just click on the links. Yeah, so uh, this is a new one. This is the last video I'm gonna share, but um, this started right? Wait, what happened? Okay. <laughs> this is a new project and Humans, whenever we're in the woods, we kind of affect what's going on. But the trail cameras is everything. Those are three bobcat triplets. That's your bobcat babies. This is all taken at one tiny little beaver pond in the bog, in a remote part of the bog. And here's a big male bobcat. Big, big boy coming through. So, and we've recorded some really fascinating natural history. Here's this bobcat, and I don't know if he's hunting this beaver or I've got minutes and minutes of this bobcat going back and forth on this log, and here this beaver always comes to join him. <laughs> like, that's enough. <laughs> but he, he's been splashed so many times, so I, I'm not sure what's going on. We have raccoons at this beaver pond, and then this happened. Three raccoons crossing this log, and then Whoa. here comes Bobcat. He's like, okay, raccoon, that's still pretty big prey. I don't know if I can tackle a beaver, but how about a raccoon? And then a the raccoon comes down the tree. But it's strange. Like, look at it. There they both go across the log. And it's like he's not hunting it. He's just like almost like playing with them. I, I don't know what's going on, but stay tuned. Um, a rare cinnamon phase black bear. Um, but of course, these bears never like your camera placements. Um, they always got to feel like they got to change it for you. <laughs> 
And then that says exactly two months later, a uh, big a black black bear comes by. And he's like, no, that's not a good angle. <laughs> so, he's like, Spark, you want to look up in the trees? Um, so we had some timber wolf pups. There's mom. There's there's mom. Pup one. There's pup two coming. You know, how many times do you ever see ever see wolf pups? Um, and then here is a beautiful male. I've got multiple cameras, so I got one hitting going and then coming by, and uh, he's checking out a scent. You know, but beaver dams are an amazing bridge, right? They're a bridge for these animals. Um, otters, of course, we know they're curious. This is the same place. He's like, what is going on? And I tell you, busy as a beaver is the truth. This guy never quits. That's a big log. And then he's tackling this giant, giant tree. He's got, he's literally got eight trees that he's halfway through and he's never finished them. But yeah, he's day and night, he's swimming around. This was cool. This is, I, I almost positive this is a barred owl. And it appears to me that it's fishing for prey fish in the, in the pond. And this is behavior that's pretty rare, rarely ever encountered or seen. And then, you know, I thought at first, is he just bathing? But no, he is actually hunting uh, in the water. He'll get down in the water and then look into the water and feel around. Um, I hope to get more video because that, that's a rarely documented thing. <laughs> this is, I don't know if you knew this, but rough grouse display in the fall as well. This guy was pursuing this female and chasing it, literally chasing it. This is in slow motion. I mean, he, was, he was running after. So anyway, just kind of a, a fun new project that we're doing. Science and research has become a big thing for us. Uh, kestrels, we have 50 nest boxes up over in the bog and we've banded over 500 chicks now. They're not doing well in parts of the country, but they're doing pretty darn good in the Sag Zoom bog. We've also been studying hawk owls. Where do our hawk owls come from? I don't have an answer for you yet. Where do our shrikes come from? Abby Valeen, Connecticut warblers, um, yeah, we, this was interesting. They tagged one, they found they go all the way to Brazil, we knew that. But when they come back, they make a circular route and they go over the Atlantic in the fall and then back through the Bahamas and Cuba and Florida in the spring. And this one, that pink dot way out to the left, it ended up by Sioux Falls, South Dakota and said, this ain't boreal forest and did a beeline back to the Sag Zimbog and was recaptured a year later in the exact same spot I was uh, caught the first time. So we're learning more and more. Where do our, our evening gross beaks come from? Well, we don't really know yet. They, they come from all over, Manitoba, Ontario, Quebec, and Minnesota. But land preservation, this is huge for us. Our Owls and Warblers Critical Corridor Project is, is, um, has really amped, ramped up our land preservation. We now have 25,000 acres. Um, yeah, that's <laughs> Definitely the most proud of that. And, you know, 90 plus percent of it is a permanent conservation easement. Um, that's the size of Disney World. That's the size of 6.5 bobcat habitats, 2.5 raven habitats. It's bigger than every single Minnesota State Park except two, Itasca and St. Croix. We're bigger than five national parks. So we're we're uh, we're pretty proud of that, and it's all because donations and partnerships with our, our bog buddies we call all our donors. And so now it's a big yellow blob on the map. This is uh, we're trying to connect now, connect um, uh, into a corridor, wildlife corridor. We call this new big new acquisition Great Gray Peatland. So and and climate, you know, you know, when we started this, uh, climate change wasn't really on our radar. About, I mean, it was, but not for the friends of Saxon Bog. And and now, of course, more and more. So, 
And what we're finding is bog is about the best thing you can preserve. I mean, uh, sphagnum moss is the, uh, can sequester the most carbon of any plant per weight on the planet. Um, and so you got to preserve that sphagnum moss. Uh, and this is hard to read, but it says only 3% of the world's land cover is bog, but um, it stores as much carbon as the world's forests combined. Um, but a disturbed peatland can emit a very shocking amount of carbon back into the atmosphere, like what happened in Indonesia, those fires in Indonesia a few years ago was so horrible for the uh, carbon release. So right now we, you know, this is all kind of science that's new and, but we calculated that we're, we're capturing 3.7 million metric tons of carbon. I know that doesn't really mean anything, but it's a lot, it's a lot, it's a lot. So that's, you know, and there's been headlines around the world. And I like this one, meet Pete, the unsung hero of carbon capture and Northland peat bogs are carbon hogs. Uh, those are great headlines. Um, but it's also comfortable if you want to take a nap. Um, it's uh, very spongy. And, uh, so yeah, the think globally, act locally. I know that's you know uh, part of your uh, mission as well. And for us, you know, we you know we're not going to do much for protecting bog in Siberia. Uh, you know, but we can start right here and get word out. So will there be bog around in a hundred years? And this was my existential crisis a few years ago. Because you know the predictions are that we're at the very southern end of the boreal forest. You know, will it be gone? And some people say 100 years. Some people say 80 years. Some people don't say. <laughs> but you know, uh, I think bogs are a little more resilient to climate change because of acidic soils. Um, but uh, you know, could it be a thousand years? We don't know. But um, my board helped me think through this, and here's the answer we came up with. And well, because our crystal ball. <laughs> Yeah, we got to get one of these. That was what they said. We got to get a crystal ball. Unfortunately, most of them are broken. So, um, yeah, it's really hard to find a good crystal ball. But habitat is habitat. And so this land will be preserved for future generations. If it's oak savanna, fine. If it's bog, wonderful. You know, whatever it is, it'll be habitat for something. Um, maybe saber tooth tigers will come back. Yeah. <laughs> In the beginning, you showed a picture of Google One and Google Two. Um, I'm wondering what has happened to that area of the bog that had been cut down for paper, and what what's come of that since then? Very good question, and I totally forgot that because the mill in Duluth closed. Um, not we're not supposed to be happy about that, but. They're now making toilet paper out of recycled wood uh, and pulp, so that's awesome. Um, the market, as you know what happened to newspapers, you know, the, the market for shiny Sunday newspaper inserts has plummeted and um, Black Spruce now, the county is, used to be, you know, that was their thing, Black Spruce. Now they're like, you know, we'll, we'll deal with Friends of Zags and Buck because they want Aspen now. And we want black spruce. So we're doing these complicated trades with the conservation fund to get that. Because we can get two acres of bog for one acre of aspen now. Oh. So, um, and, and it's regrowing. Tamarack regrows really fast. And so in 20 years, it'll, it'll look pretty good again. Black spruce takes a lot longer, but it's coming back. And uh, we're not in the restoration business uh, or rewilding at this juncture. It's coming back in. It's coming back as tamarack and black spruce, yeah. And but the, the the danger is that it might dry out and not come back like that. So that's the uh, danger. Let's hold on uh, one thing because I want to be mindful of time. So yeah. let's let's give Mark a chance to wrap up before we go to Q and A. Okay, and I'm I'm pretty much done. So what's next for friends? Uh, we're finishing up that Augie's bog walk. Um, we had that snow on Halloween, and that. Uh, is, you know, we got to get things done. It's winter's coming. We're more educational and fun videos coming your way. Another major land purchase. I don't have details yet, but um, probably we're talking about another thousand acres. Um, collaborating with Snow Change in Finland. You, I don't know if any of you are here to see Tiro Mustin and talk. Um, we will be working with them on some projects, likely in the future, and looking a little more globally. And um, that's probably, you know, one of our future things is a little more education globally. So, yeah, so 
We're supported through mainly through individuals, 84% last year, this year, 77%. But yes, huge thank you to you guys for the, the woven basket and for having us speak here. We really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Sandy. I know I speak for all of us, and I'm going to give it to Barbara just a little bit, but I'm going to start this woven basket. I know we'll also collect at the service, but for anyone that might not be at the service, feel free to start giving and giving generously. And Barb, before we go to Q&A, feel free to let us know a little bit more about the calendars and anything else. You should talk to Sparky about some of the photographer. There's an eight-year-old photographer in here who's the best birder around of that age anyway for a long time. And Sparky has a lot of photographs in here. They are not credited to anybody, I guess, because he produces the counter calendar. Also, a lot of other people that you may know. $20, am I right for this? $15, and you can save the, you can save the um, mailing cost if you get it here right now. They're great to have for the photographs alone. Never mind the dates. Thank you, Sparky. And uh, I think we have time for one or two questions, and then we'll have to put it on pause, and I'm sure Mark can stick around if anyone has additional questions. I know um, I see Giger's hand, and then we'll go to Beth. This was a terrific presentation. Thank you, Sparky. Um, clearly, we draw nationally and internationally a lot of people. Are you collaborating with the economic people of the area for the impact? What else do people do? How long do they stay? And what's the impact of Bob? That yeah, we, we did a survey a while ago and... Uh, oh. Only one left. We did a, oh, I have more. Scarcity. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we, um, we did a survey and we figured that each winter about over a million dollars comes into the regional economy by burgers. The problem is it's mostly Duluth and mostly Duluth because there's not a lot of, you know, what's up there? There's a gas station <laughs> and a cafe. So, but we're, we're, we're building, we have a good neighbor fund. We're building bridges in the area, which is my one of my biggest goals because not everybody loves us and the people that don't love us are vocal. Um, we're, we're, you know, a lot of it's birdings on the road. So people have to behave themselves because I don't run the roads. I don't control any roads. So the sheriff, you know, we have to get, you know, it's, yeah. it's winter sometimes it's crazy, but uh, I, I'm happy we just donated much money to the Kelsey Volunteer Fire Department. We're just we're trying to be good neighbors up there, and uh, people love, love people. Love, so many locals have come forth that they love what we're doing. They love the boardwalks and what we're doing. So it's always a little bit of a battle. Yeah. One quick question. I'm sorry. Oh, I just wanted to give a plug. I took the uh, intro to the bog, um, uh, boardwalks in June, Barbara and I did, and we did have to wear mosquito nothing, but it was a phenomenal way to learn. And, and I, I do swear that Clinton is the closest thing to a walking encyclopedia. <laughs> and they have another intro in the winter coming up pretty soon. So if you haven't been there, um, it's just a way to, to really learn a lot and see a lot. Quick question, do you coordinate with the other big bog, one up in North of Red Lake? Uh, and, you know, because they have the boardwalk, and many of us have been there. Yeah, Big Bog up in, by Red Lake, that's DNR. And, um, yeah, we, we took our whole board up there and did a full day with them and uh, just learned from them, and we learned some valuable things from them. Um, the state's not big on collaborating. We've done uh, Zoom for them and, and such for the DNR, but uh, they, they told us we learned some valuable things about bog res uh, restoration and... Um, preservation for sure well thank you so much i'll, I'll be around if you want to chit chat uh, for a few minutes thank you thank you thank you mark for being a real hero for all of us and this was just a riveting presentation and definitely feel free to stick around if you haven't donated yet and then also next week our forum will be the uucd endowment committee so we're talking about how to give and how to give generously we'd love to see you there and again thank you so much for being here today everyone don't forget to vote Brochures, if you want a brochure as well, these are free. Yeah. <laughs>
Thank you all.